started. <laughs> All right, we're streaming. Kathy, we're we're streaming now. Okay. Okay, let's get started then. Hi everyone. I think we are live. Um, hope you're able to see us on Facebook. Let us check that we are indeed. Oh, okay. I'm seeing are it. We now. On? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if we can do, if we can figure out how to do the watch party. <laughs> get started, Ben. Hi, everyone. Okay. Okay, we're on. Great. Oh. Hi, everyone. On a Saturday afternoon here from Bali, it's 2 p.m. here, uh, 6 p.m. in Majuro. And wherever you are in the world, thanks for joining us. My name is Tomo Hamakawa. Um, co-founder of Earth Company. I'm here with my wife and co-founder. I'm Asuka. Hi. Asuka. And we're joined. Um, we have, we're very happy to have Kathy with us today. Hi, Kathy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> happy to be here. <laughs> so we have uh, about 60 minutes together and we'll start off with a quick um, explanation about Earth Company um, by Aska, and then we'll turn it over to Kathy, uh, who will briefly share about her work, uh, and then we'll the majority of the time will be spent just chit chatting, um, you know, asking Kathy about her experience as an impact hero, and then also um, the things that she has uh, in 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 the works uh, in the plans uh, going forward. So. Without further ado, let's get started with the Earth Company overview. The video. Oh, we're starting with the video, Earth Company video. Okay, great. <laughs> If there are people dedicating their lives to tackle some of the world's most pressing challenges, then we need to support them. That's why we started Earth Company. We select and support exceptional, one-of-a-kind change makers who can make much deeper and wider impact if they have access to resources. We call them impact heroes. Before I was a midwife, I was very happy as a school teacher, but I had this calling to give babies a chance to arrive on the earth without trauma and to give mothers respectful care. Our first clinic was in Bali. It started not as a clinic, it started as just a door-to-door -door service. And all of our services were always free. And I found that the people here had many, many difficulties getting the care that they needed in their pregnancy and for birth and for postpartum care. I had a lot of heartbreak in my life. My sister died. She died from a complication of pregnancy. The doctor, all he had to do was give her medication. All he had to do was look at her chart and care for one minute. So I decide then, okay, being a school teacher is nice, but I want to be a midwife because I believe if my sister had a midwife, the midwife would hold her hand and make sure that the doctor listens to her. Earth Company uh, was the one that raised the money for the medical wing with the acupuncture and the doctor and the lab and everything. Without Earth Company, the clinic is not finished yet. They really stayed involved with Bumi Sehat and with me. I believe on the level of our souls, something matching, something special. So they're very, very instrumental in making Bumi Sehat stronger. Also through Earth Company, we were able to have a clinic for a childbirth in Sentani, Papua. 
we keep the baby with mother 100% of the time, skin to skin, 100% breastfeeding at Bumi Sehat. If you immediately clamp and cut the cord, they won't have their full blood supply. If you take them away from mother immediately, then they will suffer from trauma, from separation from placenta and from mother. And then with that trauma, it closes your heart. So your capacity to love and trust is deeply affected. And they will grow up according, very much depending on how they are born. There's a Native American proverb that says, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. We believe there's so much truth in these words. The world is full of issues and so many people are struggling just to survive. Some people can change that reality. There are people who can change that reality. Everyone should be able to write their own endings to their own stories. We need more people who can make that happen. Every Robin, she's not an ordinary midwife. She's not only catching babies, she's saving the world and building peace, one baby, one mother, one family at a time. She goes to some of the most marginalized communities in the world and most disaster struck towns and support those that most need it. The more I found out about her, I knew we had to support her. How can I make the world a better place? Why was I born? All the humans in the world are born to love. I mean, how do you get to Earth? Two people have to make love. It's the planet of love. So it's, that's why it's so important to love. We want every single citizen of Earth to have an intact capacity to love and trust. And I do everything I can every day toward that goal. And I believe that we can all do something. And if everybody does something, it's going to work. I have a lot of hope. Maybe I'm crazy. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm crazy, but that's okay. I hope everybody could be crazy for love because I am crazy for love and I'm crazy for peace. Okay. I hope that gives everyone a sense of what Earth Company does, uh, especially for the impact heroes. Now we'll go to a short presentation by Asuka on the Impact Hero program. Let's us share. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to explain briefly about the Impact Heroes program uh, because this is um, um, sort of a, a one way to promote our call for application for the next Impact Hero. Um, so this, so we've been doing um, a lot of Heroes Talk series, and this is the last one. Um, so Kathy was our Impact Hero 2017, and so we've had uh, five Impact Heroes so far. And uh, there are other things that we do, but we're just going to focus on talking more about the Impact Heroes program today. Um, but just briefly to explain, uh, you know, the, the, the overall um, picture of what we do. So our mission is really to, to support and, and empower individuals and institutions that can create a world we can pass on to the next generations. Um, and for that, we do four things. And one thing is to um, support these impact heroes and, and they are the ones that know how to make a change in the world. And they have very um, high potential um, of uh, making these changes uh, to create a sustainable world and a more inclusive world. And uh, Impact Academy is uh, sort of a, a training, uh, educational programs that we provide for people who aspire to become change makers. And then Impact Consulting is what we do um, to help corporate um, organizations become more sustainable and become more social, socially minded and, and inclusive. And we actually run an eco hotel here in Ubud uh, in Bali. This is sort of a manifestation of all our values and, and um, sort of the vision that we want to, to make happen in the future. So um, with this, I'll start talking more about the impact heroes. And so the impact heroes that we select, uh, so we select just one um, exceptional, one of a kind change maker per year, and we give them three years of customized support. And, and they are authentic and passionate and grounded and, and, and all those things that are on this slide. 
Um, and there have been five impact here so far, um, and they come from various regions um, all over Asia Pacific, um, including Timor Leste, Indonesia, Philippines, Marshall Islands, like Kathy, um, Myanmar. And they do lots of different things. Uh, we don't focus on just one um, specific issue, but uh, we try to help uh, whatever issues that they're, uh, they're trying to address, starting uh, with environmental education, uh, it could be child health, um, youth empowerment, climate change, peace building, um, could be, we're agnostic. Uh, so um, we, it could be pretty much anything. Um, and there have been finalists. Um, and there are just this amazing people. And, and this, these were the 2018 finalists and they were the 2019 finalists. And we haven't been able to extend our support to these finalists so far, but then uh, starting next year, we're, uh, we're hoping uh, we can ex extend our support to these people as well. And uh, we do five things for them. We do leadership coaching, uh, marketing support, business development, management consulting, and the, big, the, the biggest thing is the fundraising. Um, and so we raise, we're not a foundation, so we don't have money to, to give away, but we help them with fundraising. And so uh, we try to raise uh, from something like $100,000 up to $350,000. It really depends on uh, the impact hero and, and where um, she or he wants to uh, focus uh, our support to. Uh, so some people want to really focus on fundraising. Some people uh, really want us to focus on the marketing support or the management consulting. And so it's really up to them. Um, and in three years, we do a lot of things. Uh, we do fundraising, we do you know marketing support and, and, and management consulting, and we actually bring them to Japan where we're registered. Uh, we're also registered in Indonesia. We bring them to Bali as well. Um, and we uh, connect them to potential supporters and, and collaborators and stuff like that. Um, so far, we've raised about $800,000 for the five impact heroes, and, and we've reached out to 600,000 people through the work of the impact heroes. And these are some of the things that we've built with the impact heroes, in, uh, and this includes, this is the in green school we built together with the impact hero 2015. Um, she was from Timor Leste, um, Green Villas, um, it's a clinic in Bali, it's a clinic and birth clinic in Papua. Um, we did some disaster management. The 2018 was a major disaster year. Uh, we even built an evacuation center in Bali um, clinic in the Philippines. And this is uh, what we built together uh, with Kathy. And this is a climate change uh, youth center um, for the NGO that she runs in the Marshall Islands called Jojikum. She can talk more about it later. And this is the most recent project that, that we're working with our current impact here, which is Wei Wei. Uh, she's a Rohingya person. Um, and this is sort of a peace building youth center kind of thing that she built in Yangon. So we're helping her uh, run this place uh, with the operational cost. So these are some of the things that we've been doing for the impact here. And now we wanna move on to uh, introducing Kathy and, and have her introduce herself. So we'll pass it on to Tama. Yeah, great. Um... Before we give the floor to Kathy, just want to say a few words about how amazing Kathy is. And also we'll show uh, one of her uh, poetry performances um, to, just to set the context and then we'll pass it on to Kathy. Um, so Kathy uh, is from the Marshall Islands, but she spent a lot of time in Hawaii. Uh, and then after returning to the Marshalls, uh, she was really um, kind of devastated to see the the, the changes that were hap that was that were happening in her country, <clears throat> and then in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, she was chosen uh, as uh, as a speaker at the UN Climate Summit uh, in New York, uh, and she was chosen from over five or six hundred uh, people candidates, and so and then she. Um, uh, delivered a performance um, of her um, own poem, Mata Felipenum, that's dedicated to her daughter, and uh, who was just, I think, just maybe a year old or something uh, back then. Seven months old, I think. Seven months old. Um, and it was a really inspiring um, uh, yeah, speech uh, performance that uh, really drew attention to her work uh, and really became the voice of or one of the voices of the, the Pacific Islanders um, who are really fighting for this cause. 
Yeah, and then I think what from from our perspective, what what um, makes her work quite special is really the top down approach as well as the bottom up work. Um, and so she's invited to these uh, international um, forums to talk about the plight uh, and the and, and the challenges in the Pacific Islands, um, and also not just Pacific Islands, but also low low lying states. Um, <clears throat> But also, she um, she also is engaged in youth empowerment work uh, in the Marshalls uh, through her organization, Joe Jickum. And we really think that kind of that combination of a top down approach, um, as well as bottom up approach uh, is quite effective and, and very unique. Um, I think not many change makers um, uh, can do that. Um, very few, I think, in in the in the climate change space, as well as in, in, in other areas of social social environmental issues so um yeah it's been really a pleasure working with her since 2017 we've uh, we've definitely had have had our ups and downs uh mostly ups um uh, mostly enjoyable um just kidding like completely enjoyable and we've spent a lot of good times in the marshals uh and also in japan and uh, yeah, we t we've been. Re it's really an honor for us to be able to work with her and her team, and to to for us to better understand the issues, the, the complexities uh, surrounding uh, climate change and the nuclear issues and, and and everything that she she addresses. So with that, um, let's play the uh, play uh, the video of of her performing uh, the poem "Anointed," <clears throat> and then we'll. Pass it on to Kathy. I'm coming to meet you. I'm coming to see you. What stories will I find? Will I find an island or a tomb? To get to this tomb, take a canoe. Take a canoe through miles of scattered sun. Swallow endless swirling sea. Gulp down radioactive lagoon. Do not bring flowers or speeches. There will be no white stones to scatter along this grave. There will be no songs to sing. How shall we remember you? You were a whole island once. You were breadfruit trees, heavy with green globes of fruit, whispering promises of massive canoes. Crabs dusted with white sand scuttled through pandanus roots. Beneath looming coconut trees, beds of watermelon slept still, swollen with juice. And you were protected by powerful Eroids, chiefs burst from women who could swim pregnant for miles beneath a full moon. Then you became testing ground. Nine nuclear weapons consumed you one by one by one, engulfed in an inferno of blazing heat. You became crater, an empty belly. Plutonium ground into a concrete slurry filled your hollow caverns. You became tomb. You became concrete shell. You became solidified history, immovable, unforgettable. You were a whole island once. Who remembers you beyond your death? Who would have us forget that you were once green globes of fruit, pandanus roots, and whispers of canoes? Who knows the stories of the life you led before? Here is a story of a turtle goddess. She gifted one of her sons, Leda, a piece of her shell anointed with power. A leathery green fragment, hollow as a piece of bark. It gave Leda the power to transform into anything, into houses and trees, the shapes of other men, even kindling for the first fire. He almost burned us alive. I am looking. 
looking for more stories. I look, and I look. There must be more to this than incinerated trees, a cracked dome, a rising sea, a leaking nuclear waste with no fence. There must be more to this than a concrete shell that houses death. Here's the story of another shell, anointed with power. Leodao used it to transform into kindling for the first fire. He gave this fire to a small boy. The boy almost burned his entire village to the ground. Licks of fire leapt from skin and bones from strands of coconut leaves. While the boy cried, Leodao laughed, laughed. This is a story of a people on fire. We pretend it is not burning all of us. Here is the story of the ways we've been tricked, the lies we've been fed. It's not poisonous anymore. Your illnesses are normal. You're fine. You're fine. My belly is a crater empty of stories and answers. Only questions, hard as concrete. Who gave them this power? Who anointed them with the power to burn? All right. So now we'd like to invite Kathy uh, to the virtual stage. Um, and uh, yeah, Kathy, if you can just uh, briefly introduce yourself and then explain about you know why you do what you do and also just brief overview of what, what you do. That would be great. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Tomo. Um... So basically, uh, I think at the heart of what I do is poetry. So that's the really the center. That's what grounds me in all of the work that I do. Um, but I try to use poetry to spin off to, to explore these issues that really matter to me. And so the issues that have mattered to me that I focused on primarily has been the nuclear legacy, as you saw in Anointed, and climate change. Um, so it began with poetry. And so that's when I got invited to the UN and um, well, I got selected to speak as a civil society representative at the UN. And that really changed kind of the trajectory of my career path. Before that, I was teaching at the college um, and running the nonprofit, our nonprofit Jyotigum on the side. Um, so the kind of this element of education, arts and a nonprofit community work has always been kind of integral to what I was doing. And then I started uh, attending more and more, and I stayed engaged basically in climate, in the climate realm um, and the international stage specifically attending the conference of the parties, the COP, which is the yearly climate change uh, international conference. Um, and so as I kind of kept my foot in that door, I started to sort of understand a little bit more of the processes. Um, and then I became, uh, uh, I, uh, I started as Climate Envoy. Um, our governments created these new positions called Climate Envoy, recognizing the kind of urgency of the issue of climate change and how much they, you know, that we need support, you know, us every realm. And so now I'm running our Jyotigum uh, nonprofit as director. I'm part time as Climate Envoy, and I'm taking a short break from artistic work, but I've been creating artistic performances and um, also videos like that for the past three or four years or so. And um, it's been sort of a way to explore poetry beyond the page, you know, and trying to see what it's like as a performance in art installation spaces, as well as in, um, uh, in video. So um, anyways, I guess those are all the way. So I, I think for me, it's been really important to be 
to be useful at all of these different levels at the international level as at the national technical level and then also um at the grassroots and then the creative level so there's you know it's sort of trying to understand how to weave in through these different uh realms and how to uh kind of shift and sort of uh shifts who I am and how I even educate and how I speak to the audiences I work with at each of these different levels. Right. Now I'm even more in the technical realm of climate change work. And that's really interesting for me, like, and then figuring out how to translate what's happening there to the international, to the arts and to the, you know, the youth that I work with on the community yeah. level is challenging, but really interesting. Mm. Well, as if those weren't enough, you're also doing your PhD, right? Yes. So I just started, but yeah. 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 Right. So there, I mean, there's so many levels. Um, and I think, yeah, as I said earlier, that I think that's what makes you quite unique uh, in the work that you do. Just wondering, like, at which level do you feel the most comfortable? Like, you know, I mean, you, I'm sure you're very capable uh, in different realms, but if you can just pick and choose the most comfortable one for you, which one would it be? That's kind of tough because I sort of, it's, I've been moving through these realms and yeah. I keep thinking like, you know, when I'm in one realm on the tech, doing the technical meetings yeah. and preparing like frameworks for consulting on climate change with our community, yeah. it's like, oh, this is hard. Then I work with the young people and I have to figure out a program to make sure that, and make sure they're getting the support that they need holistically. Then I'm like, this is also hard. And then I do <laughs> hard. You know, and I have to sit and really meditate and think through what is it that I want to communicate and what is the, you know, what level do I want to communicate it through? And do I include art and poetry or is it a performance? And that's hard too. So I actually don't know which one is the most comfortable. So it it used to be, I think poetry and art is probably like yeah. the heart center. For me. I think that's kind of what what connects me the deepest. So I think that's probably it. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel like you have to switch like mental gears uh, as you go into different meetings or different, you know, engagements? A little bit. I think it's, I think we all kind of do that though. You know, mm -hmm. when we're at home or we're with certain friends, we're, we're switching yeah. gears a little bit. And so that's yeah. kind of what I'm doing as well. And, mm -hmm. and then sometimes a lot of what I'm doing informs the other. So there's mm -hmm. been times when yeah. I worked yeah. with young people and that inspired a poem. And then there's been times when um, I used the poem for an international meeting, you know, and yeah. I used some kind of poetic language to introduce uh, some talking points, you know. Yeah. And then there's been times when uh, when I someone asked me on the international level to speak on youth and young people and engagement, and mm -hmm. I can actually say, well, actually, two weeks ago we just hosted a climate change and arts camp right, with right. forty students. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, and I think like, that's that's probably one of the most um, rewarding or fulfilling moments, right? When different aspects of your life actually come together in kind of a seamless way. And there's synergy yeah. between the different things that you're doing, right? And I and it's great to hear that that that's happening, you know, in your work. Um, and that that's probably that's probably why you feel like there's not one that's comfortable, but the, but it's 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 actually a combination that you probably feel um, quite comfortable and confident in. So yeah, that that's really great to to hear. What about um, uh, just one more question from me? Like you know, like. I know it's very difficult to talk about the future, uh, especially in the um, area of climate change. Um, do you see yourself, you know, balancing these different levels um, for the foreseeable future or even beyond that? Um, or yeah, do you have any um, idea how you want to design your, your career? Um, I think for me, it's sort of like, uh, I can't, I can't think that, think that long term, but yeah. I think that, uh, it's more just about going with what, what's happening right now. And, yeah. you know, if, if these continue, if I continue to be able to serve as Climate Envoy and, or yeah. to work as Climate Envoy, and then also run the nonprofit, um, and do art, that's great. Obviously it's, it's, it takes a lot of like figuring out, you know, there's practical parts of it, you know, will you get hired again and stuff like that. And then there's also other parts of it, like, 
oh, I, I kind of needed a break from performing, you know, full time and, and going mm -hmm. around full time. It was really mentally and kind of emotionally exhausting for yeah. me. So yeah. being able to take a break and just focus on technical work has been kind of helpful. So mm -hmm. I sort of feel like it's more just about going with where I'm needed the most and then also figuring out how to balance my own energies and, and figure out what where, right. where I can mm -hmm. contribute the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And now, Nate, from, from the future, maybe we can talk about the past. Um, yeah. And so we've we worked with you for, um, I think, since, since the beginning of 2017. Um, so it's been, um, I guess, three and a half yeah. years um, since, since four then. Four years. We started four years. 2016, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, I still remember the first time I spoke to, we spoke to you um, over Skype. And I still remember where we were. It was at this place called the Onion Collective yeah. in Ubud. Um, and yeah, we just getting to, to know you. And if you can kind of, you know, think about where you were th back then, uh, so let's say, you know, end of 2016. Um, and, you know, fast forward to now, like what are, what are some of the biggest differences um, I mean, you don't have to attribute to a company. I'm just saying, like in general, like what what are what are some of the the, the glaring differences in your in your life? Well, I did not think I'd be climate envoy at all. I have been told <laughs> by different people that I might not be able to do that kind of work, but <laughs> it is okay. I mean, they didn't they didn't trust your diplomatic skills. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember. So we went to the COP together back in 2016, right? It was the COP 22 in yeah. Morocco. Yeah. And at the time you were saying that you, you just want to perform. You don't want to deal with politics. You're not yeah. a politician. You do not yeah. want to be in politics, right? And right. you said you would not be taking such a role in, in politics. It's still, in politics. it's still technically not politics. Can I just oh. say? Yeah. 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 I agree. No, it's funny. Yeah, you're right. It's pretty different. So yeah. I think I, it's, I still sort of don't know, to be honest, that I'm cut out for it. I mean, I'm still in such of the beginning stages of this. You're in, you're in denial. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, it is really like intellectually stimulating. It's like a completely different world. And there's there's the language to it. You know, I remember when I learned first learned how to weave mm -hmm. uh, from, my artist, uh, from one of my uh, performances. Mm -hmm. And that had its own language. And so now I'm in this international realm that has its own language. And so seeing those kind of connections and the ripples that come out of those kind of meetings is actually really fascinating for me. So to be ever, to be fair, I didn't know that I would I would find it this interesting, you know, when I was first uh, considering it or thinking it through and stuff. Mm. But um, I think the biggest change was that I wasn't really sure how to run a nonprofit. Like we had, I, I had this organization, we had this kind of, yeah. motley crew of people who were sort of involved loosely involved loose idea of what we wanted to do and i think it's gotten a lot more like structure and stability for our nonprofit. and i sort of have a bit better kind of grounding of knowing kind of what i want what how i operate and and then how to sort of deliver that a little bit better so i think yeah i think that's kind of the biggest difference i was living in portland i wasn't living back home now i'm i'm finally living back home where I've been wanting to come back. Um, and I think, and I'm more involved now in our national government in cli on climate change than I was before. You know, before I was really on the outskirts. I was just sort of creating on my own in the wild, you know? <laughs> and now it's like, oh, now I know what's actually happening. And mm. I think it's it's a lot easier to kind of make those connections. But yeah, I think, I think that's those are kind of the short answer of the yeah, difference. Yeah. Just on the nonprofit management, and I think um, without giving ourselves too much credit, I mean that's one area we played. No, probably that was time. huge. That was definitely all you guys. You know, you definitely. No, no. <laughs> uh, well, we uh, kind of forced you to say that, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, we made we made a, okay. we made a small contribution on that front, and yeah. just like what are some of the you know big lessons or big changes that you you've made in jojikum that are you know or i guess that have been effective or or you know that are positive from your perspective well having a, a center a youth center is 
mm. huge. You know, even though it's just this little house and a lot of people actually mistake it for an actual house. Um, <laughs> right. Nice. You know, um, but having this youth center there has been so nice. You know, even yeah. though I'm, I, I work as climate envoy, I actually most days I'll work from Jyotigun. So unless I have okay. meetings, I'm mm. going in every morning and, you know, staying all day just yeah. to monitor the center. And having a space where, you know, like young people can just show up and hang out, you know, yeah. and read yeah. comic books and listen to music and listen and draw. And, you know, that's all they're doing. I think that actually creates, you know, a, a bit more of a community. Um, and I think that's, yeah. So in terms of like what, you know, we wouldn't have had that without Earth Company. And then also you guys were able to help us sort of force us to sit down and really like figure out what are we doing here with these kids? Like, what yeah. are you doing here with them? And what do you want, you know, of the outcome to be? Yeah. And those were questions we didn't ask ourselves in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we really needed to take a hard look at that. And so I think that work with you all kind of, you know, that did everything for us in helping us figure that out. Oh, we'll, uh, we'll make a clip of that, of that <laughs> video and uh, we'll uh, immortalize it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to ask questions? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um... Yeah, like some of the things that I want to ask you is that um, the, the climate change dialogue has changed um, over time, right, for the past decades. I, I mean, the world has talked about this for decades now, and some things have changed and some things stay this, the same. And, you know, but I think um, over the past, well, like I, I also did um, my research, uh, grad school research on climate change as well. And then this started at like maybe 2007. So it's been like uh, over a decade. But, you know, even with, you know, within that um, time, it has changed quite a bit. And, you know, back then it was all like, all they talked about was science and politics, right? And like some people were feeling like, you know, it's not just about math, it's not just about figures, you know, it's, it's about human, it's about what we're going to lose and, you know, what's going to happen to us, right? And, you know, some of, some countries are gonna feel this so much more and some of them are not gonna feel as much as others. Um, but, you know, we really need to hear from those people who are gonna be affected most, right? And those people include uh, people from your country, right? And around, from the Pacific region um, mostly, but um, back in the day, there was no space for art in, you know, climate change dialogue. Mm -hmm. But I think um, the, the role wants to hear more uh, from uh, the people who wants to voice their, voices but not able to do that and I think you speak for them and you speak for yourself and for your country right um how do you think this climate change dialogue is going to change or, um, from now on uh, what is what is the role of art in all of this um how do you feel um like how effective do you think uh, this approach is and how necessary mm -hmm. this is to address climate change altogether yeah, um, I think art is, you know, it's such a, you know, not everybody gets it. It's not everybody's passion, you know, which mm -hmm. I get. There's like high contemporary art and then there's sort of more accessible pop art, but there's a ton of different ways in which art can shift and it can change things and it can communicate really complicated topics. And so I've been doing my best to continuously push that line, like, hey, like, you know, incorporate arts incorporate art into the process because it's yeah. so healing and it's such a great way to communicate such complicated issues i think i was talking to a friend and she was really saying it best you know saying that like we needed like a con to to really get what we need to happen on climate change on the nuclear testing you need more than policies and statistics there have been statistics and um and people supporting the policies for you know, decades, people have been, yeah. I, I really feel for the Pacific Islander elders, you know, and the indigenous folks who've been fighting for the past, you know, 20 years or so on climate change and then on nuclear legacy. Like, it's not a short game at all. Yeah. But what you need is the consciousness shift. That's what I think it is. You know, ultimately you need something that goes beyond politics, beyond numbers. And that's what art can do. Art can shift people, um, yeah. people's consciousness. And so I think that's the role that, it's it needs to play and it there's more and more artists that are you know yeah. engaging on the topic because more and more of them are seeing how serious it is as an issue 
for us here in the Marshalls, you know, we have people who know what climate change is, who mm -hmm. feel, who see it and who don't necessarily understand the science of it, but they've seen it and they hear mm -hmm. this kind of fear that's happening. But the problem is that we don't necessarily have the infrastructure for art. Yeah. Uh, and we don't have that to, to really push out. And that's kind of what Joe Tugum has been trying to do is create that kind of a small, at least community and, and, and an infrastructure. And so when we look at art and we look at how can artists in the future, you know, continue to push this sort of movement forward, it's not just about recognizing the importance of art, but it's also about supporting artists and creating those infrastructures to be in place so that they can continue to create, you know, because ultimately, yeah, I don't think people realize how important art is to the world. So what like what kind of art forms or, you know, medium of art do you think is gaining traction or becoming more important or more popular um, just from your perspective? I mean, that's a really tough kind of, you know, hierarchy to create. Um, there's <laughs> yeah. so many different ways, you yeah. know, there's like contemporary art in the art museums which has its own audience and has its own level of engagement then there's a there's tiktok you know like tiktok what there's creators on tiktok that's art, right that's art yeah, <laughs> yeah and they're, they're they're creating really accessible you know videos yeah. that are speaking on some really you know powerful issues too not just uh funny things but also like really fun like really powerful issues so yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's a place for humor. Um, mm -hmm. there could be definitely a place for humor. Um, and, and then you see the work of like Banksy and all of these like huge kind of pop culture artists and hip hop and, you know, mm -hmm. and pop culture. And it's just, it's sort of hard to gauge, honestly, what's kind of the most, um, yeah. effective at the mm -hmm. end of the day. I, the thing is, I just don't think there should be a limit. I think there yeah. should be all sorts of explorations and support. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. 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 Um, I think for um, with some of the people that are watching this now, I don't, um, maybe they don't know um, too much about what's going on in the Marshalls. And, you know, so basically, like, maybe if you can talk about, you know, what's happening in the Marshalls and, you know, what are the predictions saying about the future of the Marshalls and, you know, what you guys are doing about it, what we can do about it, you know, what people outside of the Marshalls can do about it, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So um, I think for a while we've all known kind of the really basic effects, which is uh, rising sea level um, and continuous wave inundations. So every time that there's a high sea level, you know, there's high, uh, high tide coupled with other factors of weather, you know, all this ocean rushes over and it crashes into homes, it destroys homes, dry, the salt dries out crops. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also reminds us of how small we are you know the atoll are we're an atoll nation so that means that there's no mountains and um it's really thin and flat the whole island and um we're only two meters above sea level basically so we're one of the most vulnerable you know nations so whenever people say coastal communities our entire country our coast is coastal communities basically um and then now we're seeing the kind of intersections with health you know, we had a three month outbreak of dengue, you know, uh, mosquito borne rate, uh, mosquito borne illnesses are actually increasing because of climate change. And we saw that firsthand with this huge dengue outbreak that overwhelmed our hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're looking also at um, even bigger than these kinds of daily tangible things is the actual disappearance of islands because of the rising sea level. Um, so we initially have been focused on getting everyone to lower their emissions so that we can save ourselves. Now we're turning inwards and we're focusing on building up our islands, figuring out what are the best ways to make sure that we stay above water. And so that's looking at really at what is the term it's adaptation for and basically adapting to the climate effects that are happening right now. So it's no longer looking at the future, no longer looking at the outside to get other people to, you know, to do to lower their emissions. That is a part of it. And we're going to continue to push that. Yeah. But our focus now is on adapting and making sure that we can stay yeah. as long as we can. So a lot of the conversation tends to focus on migration. Will you leave? When will you leave? How will you leave? Where yeah. will you leave to? Yeah. Our bottom line has always been 
will have a migration plan in place for those who want to leave, but we don't believe in forced migration. Yeah. So that's our big thing, you know, elevating lands, mm-hmm. even possibly building new islands. These are huge things that we're looking at. And especially when you look at like, cultural aspects of who we are as a people and how tied we are to the land, mm-hmm. that's going to be really difficult to plan for, for like over, you know, like almost close to 70,000 people mm-hmm. to figure out how are we going to take care of everyone? And, yeah. you know, how do we... St- so that's a short version. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Great. Um, yeah, definitely want to continue that conversation. But we actually have one um, question from our friend Ram, uh, who is based in India, and is also um, uh, Impact Hero finalist from a couple of years ago. Uh, his comment is, thank you so much for a heartfelt conversation. I'd love to know about your initial years developing an organization while being a poet. So this is kind of going back to that question of, you know, how, how do you build a, a nonprofit? And he's going through a similar process at the moment. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, you, you always start with a very small team and then with very limited resources. Yeah. And so, you know, how do you get, you know, these blocks one by one um, so that you can actually, yeah. And what's been your experience so far? Um, oh, that's been tough. I think it really helped that I had the platform from the UN to sort of start promoting it and just be like, okay. Um, so once I was, because I was a performer, I was getting called out, you know, and flown out to these different um, opportunities and given these different opportunities. And usually during those times, that's when I would talk up what Jyotigum was, who Jyotigum, yeah. you know, involved with and and then that's when you know we could garner some support but honestly I wasn't very good in those beginning stages at at making that kind of monetary connection to donations you know um I was just focused on the climate change message so deeply um I think uh what really helped honestly was the training from from earth company and being and being forced to sit down and really think it through a lot more in depth um, and then after that, it was building up a network, you know, building up a network through Earth Companies Networks for sure. But it was also building up a network here on island, you know, and that was a really integral part of it, too, was making sure that we had a reputation that people knew we were there. So actually, I guess one really um, practical sort of thing that always constantly helped was I was constantly sharing what I was doing, you know, with the young people with my performances it was just constant sharing online so that people knew oh she's still doing this she's now she's doing that and and that helped kind of gain a reputation for myself so i sort of think and i think i heard this from you um was it it might have been you guys um that it you know being the founder and being the face matters you know cultivating who you are and developing that kind of reputation um, so that people know what they're coming to you for and what you're doing matters. And so that's what I use. I used a lot of social media to kind of build that reputation so that I consistently got, you know, more and more people reaching out. We want to do this with you now. We want to do this with you now. We saw you do this. So can we do this? And that really helped a lot with networking. Now I'm moving into sort of like newsletters and donors. And that's something that I think Asuka then would know a lot more about than I do. I'm still kind of understanding that role and aspect of it but yeah I think for me it was about um, maintaining an online presence showing sharing work consistently um, Mm -hmm. creating products and um, and pushing out products and also programs you know so that people are aware that you know you're you're doing the work basically and so that the work you know the funding for that work tended to come through networks through people who wanted to work with me and then through my own searches for grants and proposals yeah. and writing proposals. Yeah. I think your your situation is is quite unique in, in a way because you as an individual uh, is you know has a very strong reputation in the climate change uh, world right and you know in starting with the, the the 2014 performance in New York and and I think my understanding is that you weren't leveraging that uh that fame you know that 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 kathy brand and t- not channeling channeling that towards joe jickham you know in the beginning and maybe you were shy about it you weren't and, and, yeah and i think it, i think 
over time, I think you realize, well, that that's really the biggest asset that you have, you know, and then and then it's about, get, you know, mm-hmm. pushing the resources, the people towards your organization, which really needed all those things. So yeah. that, that's just my perspective. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I think it was it because it was like when I got thrown into the climate work, I, I was very much like, I don't know if I want to be here. You know, I, I wasn't sure that I wanted to be there initially. Um, yeah. and, um, I, I even worried about being a climate poet. I don't want to be just a climate poet. I want to also do all these other things. I was very worried about all these, these, yes. these, you know, you didn't want to be pigeonholed into a specific. Yeah. 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 It's kind of funny because now I've really embraced it, but you know, I think <laughs> that, yeah. well, that's what took me a while, you know, was I just yeah. needed to explore and figure out what is it that I want to do ultimately. Yeah. And, you know, what is it that I care about? And so, you know, I'm as much as I love art, I'm not an art student, you know, I didn't study art or anything like that. And, um, you know, figuring all that out and how to perform and how to be a performer, that was all pretty difficult. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Maybe we'll have just quick time for like one more question or so, and then we'll move on to um, the uh, just announcement about the Impact Hero uh, call for applications. Um, yeah, I mean, what's, uh, I guess we just wanna give you an opportunity to, to make a pitch to the world. Not, not that, you know, we have millions of people watching, but you know, what, what are, you know, what are some of the, the plans you have? Um, are you fundraising right now? Are you, you know, are you looking for volunteers? Are you looking for interns? Any, 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 anything that you wanna to request, I think. Uh, now is now is a good time to do that. Um, we're definitely looking for supporters and yeah. funders. So um, we have a website, jojikum.org, J-O-J-I-K-U-M.org. And um, you can sign up for our newsletter and sign up to be a donor um, through our through our website. So I would definitely encourage that. That would be great. Um, I think that's kind of our biggest goal right now. Yeah. Where because what are some of the programs are, that you have, yeah. Are, what are some of the programs that you have in the pipeline, kind of activities in the pipeline? Okay, yeah. Um, so we just finished our second climate change arts camp, but this one was a climate and health arts camp. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was great. Uh, that was 40 high school students uh, during the summer. And then now we're working on a, um, a media training for high school students again, and you know, enrichment programs that would happen after school, training them for digital storytelling. Then we have um, an Earth Champion program, that our second Earth Champion program, where we would train youth from that are selected from each of the villages to uh, design an environmental uh, project for their villages. And, and we would give them small grants to actually manage and implement those projects. Um, besides these, we have an anti-plastic campaign. Um, we have a groundwater monitoring. We're, we're looking, we're gonna teach the connection between water and climate change and explore how uh, salt inundation has been encroaching on um, water, our fresh water. Mm. And then, oh, and then we have an environmental artist in residency program. So that'll be cool. Right. So those are our powerful projects in pipeline. That's awesome. You have you have a lot going on. <laughs> Great. All right. Yeah, the question. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll just finish off with a okay. here, right? Yeah. Ding, ding. All right. Um, yeah. So before we end it, um, I just want to uh, call for uh, applications for Impact Year 2021. Uh, the deadline is coming up next Wednesday, right? Mm-hmm. Which is the 2nd of September. Four days to go. Yeah, four mm-hmm. days to go. So um, if you are change makers that are looking to get this kind of support, or if you know of any um, change maker that will be that will make a perfect uh, Impact Hero, then please do. Um, share information to those people uh, so that we can get more applications. Um, All the information uh, necessary is on this link that's at the bottom of this page. So um, you can just check it online. Um, 
September 2nd is the submission deadline and October 2nd, uh, the shortlist candidates will be notified. And then by early November, November all the shortlist candidates will be notified of the, the final decision. So, um, and then December 15th will be the public announcement. And so uh, we're very excited to have another amazing impact here. So um, if you know of anyone uh, who will make uh, good candidates, then, then please do let us know. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, Kathy, if you know of any amazing Pacific change makers, uh, not limited to you know climate change, but okay. anything, we'll we'll love to get your recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely share for sure. Cool. Right. Thank you. All right. So I think we're just about time. Um, yeah, just want to thank you again, Kathy, for making the time on your Saturday evening. Uh, I know you have your daughter to take care of um, and uh, it's dinner time over there. Um, so thanks again. Um, yeah, and also just, you know, again, we were just really grateful for the opportunity to work with you and, and the Joe Jacob team. And uh, yeah, and you, even though you've, you've officially graduated, uh, I'm sure that we can do a lot more, uh, including developing a you know, study tour program in the Marshalls, uh, which is in, still in the works. Uh, delayed a bit due to COVID, yeah. but uh, the, our intention is, is definitely there. Yeah. Uh, and also the demand is there um, for people, you know, young people, professionals, all the people who, you know, everyone to learn from the Marshallese experience. So let's, let's make that happen for sure. Yeah, definitely looking forward to hopefully implementing that in the next two years. <laughs> I have no idea how long this COVID thing will last. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, thank you for, you know, the memory lane walk. It's been nice to kind of remember how far we've gotten and, um, you know, how many different kinds of changes have happened. So I'm, I'm happy to, luckily I, you know, Bainham's grandparents have been helping with her to this evening. So um, <laughs> but really happy that, you know, I was able to kind of spotlight the work, the awesome work that, you know, Earth Company has done. So thank oh, you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Great. All right. Say hi to Painem and your parents for us. <laughs> yeah, to all the babies. All, right. <laughs> all of the babies, because <laughs> we have so many, right? <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. 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 Mm -hmm.